Before we get in this totally fire video, just want to say go ahead, smash that red subscribe button down below. Also, do not forget to comment who you guys want to see in a future episode. That being said, I hope you guys enjoy the video, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to episode 13 of In the Film Room. Uh, I know I've been gone for a minute. Uh, we got we just got done with the season. Appreciate you guys' patience, but uh, we're back today with another big-time guest. We got Ryan Hunter of the uh, Toronto Agronauts on the channel today. How are you doing today, Ryan? What's up, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. No problem. Like I said, I really appreciate you coming on the channel. Um, first Canadian Football League we have. First international guest because you were born in Canada. So, uh, like I said, really grateful to have you here today. And um, we're going to do the longest yard. Little interview at the beginning, you know, in the film room, half interview, half uh, movie review. So, Ryan picked the longest yard, the Adam Sandler version, 2005. But uh, I'm ready to get into it if you are. Let's do it. Yes, sir. So, little little overview on Ryan. He started his career with the Chiefs and the Chargers. He was an undrafted free agent. Um, he plays for the Agronauts now up in the CFL. But coming out of Bowling Green in the MAC, he um, was undrafted, uh, bounced back and forth between the active roster, practice squad, was eventually cut, brought back, and he became a Super Bowl champion with the Chiefs and Super Bowl LIV. So uh, can you just talk about your journey and the resiliency you uh, had to have to uh, keep putting one foot in, the, uh, in front of the other and just keep going to uh, eventually be a champion? Yeah, I knew going into it, being an undrafted free agent, that it was going to be an uphill battle. Um, I mean, when you become a UDFA, teams don't really invest that much in you. So it's like really not that hard to get rid of you. And so I knew going into my first training camp that I had to prove that I belonged or I had to prove them, you know, to make a message, send a message that just because you're, you're UDFA. I mean, there's tons of guys who have become UDFAs who have had really good careers. So I just came in with a chip on my shoulder and I felt like uh, I should have been drafted. And so um, I used that as motivation for training camp going into my first year. Um, year one was kind of a blur for sure. Once I went into year two and basically I did the same schedule over and over again, I realized how much easier it is your second year. Cause your first year you have so much nervous energy, like 24 right. seven, cause you've never done it. It's like your like freshman year in college, right? You don't know what to expect. Even if it's the same schedule every week, you know, every day you never know what could happen. And so uh, that second year, I just felt way more comfortable um, in my own skin and in the offense and, you know, being in the facility, you get to know everybody um, first name basis. And so that was really like what really I felt like propelled me into making the active roster out of carrying camp my second year versus my first year was just like being more comfortable. And um, I lost a bunch of weight going into camp too. So that helps, you know, being in really, really good shape. Um, you know, I learned over the years that the better in shape you are, the whole lot easier football becomes. And so that's really kind of been my focus going into training camps is to just be in shape. I've always been pretty strong my whole life. And so that has just been a consistent, but the in shape thing is something that I really focused on a lot more uh being a pro and that kind of has helped a lot being able to you know stick around for as long as I did even if it was mostly practice squads I mean I was able to play four years in the NFL which a lot of guys aren't able to so you know, I'm pretty lucky that uh I had that little period of time um in LA and KC yes sir that's awesome um sounds like a lot uh similar to what I experienced um being a walk-on at Tulsa before I transferred to Southeastern um kind of undrafted free agent walk-on like the same deal you got to prove every day that you belong in the building really just as much to them as to yourself because you kind of get like that habits like you know I got to show why I'm here every day because you know if there's no money invested in me I'm not on scholarship or I'm not on like a big time contract so like every day I got to come put the work in because every day could be the last day you know but um that's awesome man just the story of resiliency you never gave up um you know they say the NFL stands for not for long league and I mean for you to play as long as you did in the NFL is terrific and I mean only x amount of people in the world can say they're uh, a Super Bowl champion and uh CFL champion too. We'll get into that a little bit later, but um, we're gonna go uh, a little bit farther in your career. So you did start three games during your NFL career. Um, you know that's really what most people only dream of. So can you just tell us what it meant to you and what it was like to start on the biggest uh, the biggest stage there is in uh, the game of football? Yeah, I mean it's something that's unfortunate. I'm able to do. Not a lot of people can say that they have. I mean even even when you think of how many football players have played in the NFL, I mean think of how many who haven't. Right, and so right. just to be the small percentage of people who have played um i'm pretty lucky and to be able to still play um in the cfl um i'm very thankful for that as well um i mean you just the more you the more you do it the more comfortable you get into it and the less of a big deal it seems like for you i mean i'm sure the more you went into college football the more comfortable you got the more you played the better you felt and so it's just a matter of you know repetition and consistency which is the name of the game for football you do the same thing every day every week in the hopes that it just becomes muscle memory and second nature. Right. And so, you know, you just really don't, you don't, you don't see the lights and the noise when you're in a stadium. You're just, you know, there's a 300 pound guy in front of you that you're trying right. to block. So that's really kind of who you're focused on. So, 
I mean, the crowd noise and all that is, you know, extra and it's fun to be around and it's cool to have and it's in a fantastic atmosphere. But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to block the guy in front of me. And so I just try to, you know, cancel out all the noise and all the outside stuff going on and just right. you know, focus on whatever my task is on that specific play. Yes, sir. No, I, I feel that, um, you know, big lights, big stadiums, but, you know, football is football wherever you go. But um, we were playing uh, University of Lafayette, and I was like my first start in like essentially four years. And I was like sitting there, I was like shaking. I was like, you know, this is it. And then like my parents just like, they're like, it's football. You've played it your whole life and just like just settled in. And, you know, from there I was ready to go. But um, that's awesome. Um, Yeah, I saw your picture. You at the Chiefs. I mean, the Chargers. Um, Like SoFi, that, that was sick. That looks, that picture's awesome. Yeah, but, SoFi um, is way extra. It's, I mean, it's a blimp. <laughs> the, the big screen is a blimp basically. Yeah. And then, like, all the suites are, like, glass and marble. And, I mean, they went way over the top with it, but it's L.A., yeah. so I, I don't expect any of that. <laughs> That's awesome. But um, so the third question is, um, since you were born in Ontario, Canada, and you're getting a chance to go back to, uh, to Canada playing the CFL, you know, coming out of Bowling Green, you were drafted with the last pick in the first round by the Agronauts. Uh, can you just tell us what the biggest difference is from the CFL to the NFL? I, yeah, one, I mean, obviously, the budget is one of them. I mean, the I think for our salary cap for our team, mind you, we have us players, I think it's like 45 players on the active roster. I think our our cap space is like five or six million. And then the NFL is like 200 million. So yeah. like that, that alone should tell you. I mean, for example, Pat Mahomes, who plays for the Chiefs, makes $50 million a year. So he his salary is 10x our team salary. So yeah. that kind of scale wise should give you an idea of like, you know, the difference as far as that goes. Um Skill gap definitely is a, is a big one. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's guys in the NFL who belong in the NFL, and there's guys in the NFL who don't belong in the NFL, and it's the same thing in the CFL. There's really good players, and there's really bad players. Right. Um, every team has it. I mean, there's just no way around it, but I would say definitely this like the skill gap is huge, especially on the line of scrimmage. Um, I feel like strength-wise, size-wise, and just like pass rush abilities, um, it's just different. I mean, there's the yard off the ball, I think helps a lot too, to be able to see everything happen quicker. Um, there's a lot more field. And so the defense that you see really presents itself quicker than in the NFL because the field is smaller and the guys aren't as quick in the CFL. So if you're trying to, you know, disguise your coverage and you're not that fast, you have to get to your landmark. Otherwise you're going to get burnt. And so right. things are easier to see, but there's also a lot of differences in the sense of, you know, how defenses play, you know, short yardage goal line or, you know, because we only have three downs. So there's a lot more passing downs, a lot more spread offense. There's really no like eye formation or four minute drill or any of that stuff like you see in the college game or the NFL. Right. So there's like very small differences, but there's a lot of similarities. Um, I mean, the plays are basically all the same. The plays that I've been running in the NFL, every offense is essentially the same. I, d I had three offenses in college. I had three different head coaches, and then now I've had three different – or I guess four different offenses in pros because I had two coaches when I was in L.A. So, I mean, I've seen eight professional offenses essentially in my college and, football and pro career, and they're all the same plays. They're just all different words, which makes right. it fresh for me to learn new offenses. But thankfully there's a lot of similarities in the techniques and, you know, like the, the landmarks as far as inside zone, gap schemes, protections – um but yeah as far as like the biggest differences i would say is this the skill gap um between the players is pretty i mean when you think of you know your dominant offensive lineman and defensive lineman in the nfl there's just none of those in the cfl because they get eaten up in the nfl i mean you know how it is as a lineman the right. guys in front are who win you games and so if you're big strong fast and quick they're gonna find you pretty easily right definitely uh that's crazy just because you know i watch a lot of the, the cfl and, like, you can see some of that stuff, but just, like, hearing it from, like, somebody that's, like, actually in between the lines on every play, it's, like, okay, I've, just like, catches, like, I catch glimpses of that here and there, but, like, for you to, like, actually be, like, this is what, ha like, this is the big difference, it's, like, well, I actually can see that, but now you're really just pointing it out, so that's crazy. Yeah. Um, like you said, there's good players, like, in the NFL and the CFL, there's good players everywhere. Um, so, yeah, that's really just, it's really just crazy. But um, my um, <clears throat> fifth question is going to be, what is the, uh, what professional career are you looking at for life after football? So when I was in college, I wanted to go to law school originally. Um, I still do have some interest to go to law school, but since I've been in the league in the CFL, um, I've had a couple of different like opportunities and interests come up. Um, my financial advisor has offered to take me in once I'm done playing if I'd like to go you know, the finance route. Um, since I have since I cook a lot, um, I've gotten to know a lot of the guys who work at Traeger and you know they've messed around and joked about you know if you want to be a cook for Traeger after you're done playing because I've shown them some of the stuff that I've made and 
they thought I've, I've done pretty good so far. So I always try to, you know, learn new things and new techniques on the grill or the smoker. Um, right. I also am a big jujitsu fan. So I'm potentially wow. looking at maybe doing a little bit of that after I'm done playing. Uh, it all kind of depends on like where I'm at in life, right? Like when I was yeah. in college, my goal was, you know, oh, maybe I'll play eight years in the pros and then retire and then I'll go to law school because I'll have all this money. But when the reality of me being on private practice squad for four years, I didn't make the money I thought I was going to make on active rosters and, you know, getting that big contract extension. And so sometimes life happens and, you know, it throws you a, you know, a little wrench or, you know, whatever your plan you thought it was ends up being a different plan. And so this is the path that I'm on now. And so, you know, you got to change things up a little bit based off of, you know, how much money you have in the bank and what you're able to afford. But I mean, I've been fortunate to, you know, make good money on practice squad and in the CFL. So Financially, I'm, you know, comfortable, but I'm not uh, raking in the millions like some of the guys you see on television. So, you know, you got to be able to make money and still have, you know, hobbies and pastimes and passions. And so sure. I've been able to do jujitsu and, you know, yoga Pilates are two of my other, you know, pastime passions as well that I'll do in the off season that benefit football, but I also can enjoy. And when I do them, I feel like I'm escaping reality. Like everyone needs something that to de-stress and like help you relax. And, you know, for yeah. me, those are different types of workouts that I enjoy doing that aren't football related. And so that's what I found that works for me. And so uh, I'll keep doing it. And as long as I continue to train and do those things, and even after I'm done playing, I mean, I want to be, you know, healthy and fit when I'm 40, 50 years old and yes, try sir. to you know, avoid being in a wheelchair with back problems like a lot of <laughs> right. guys. No, I, def I definitely feel I'm a big fan of uh, like running your own race and just doing whatever makes you happy. And uh, a big um, <clears throat> like reoccurring, like reoccurring theme on the channel talking to other athletes is um, they just love finding it. Well, we we just love finding um, outlets and activities to just kind of like de-stress and like just take your mind off, like being competitive or being the best, whether it be like shoe painting or just um, making YouTube videos. You do Pilates, uh, karate, all that type of stuff, making music. Um, I think every athlete needs an outlet and, uh, it sounds like you're very skilled in a, in a ton of different things. Um, what, what color is your belt in jujitsu? I'm a white belt. I have, I, so when I first started training martial arts, it was probably three or four years ago. Um, I used to do, there was a, a pro fighter, shout out to my boy, Anthony Garrett. Um, he has since moved to Dallas, but he got me into mixed martial arts at first. I started just doing like some boxing classes with him. And then he initially, and then he eventually was like, Hey, have you ever heard or tried jujitsu? And I said, I've heard of it, but never tried it. He was like, you should check it out. I think you would really, really enjoy it. And so we did a lot of, for those of you listening who know a lot about jujitsu or mixed martial arts, we did Nogi, which is more like MMA jujitsu, like traditional jujitsu. You wear basically what's like the pajama jacket and the pants. Right. So I, when I started, I was never, I never learned like the techniques or like the fundamentals. I was kind of just like, he was like teaching me what he uses or what he's learned through MMA jujitsu, which is a lot different than like traditional jujitsu. So this off season was the first time where I started training in the gi. So this, this off season will not be my second off season in it. So I'm hoping by the end of it, I'll have at least a couple stripes on my white belt. And then maybe by next year, I'll be a, a blue belt, but yeah, it's tough. Cause you can't really do it in season or if you do, right. you can only do like private sessions because you can't live spar with other people because you, you know, have a game to play that way right. or whatever it may be. Yeah. So I don't, you know, it's, it sucks that you can only do it for part of the year, but you know, I enjoy my time that I can do it in the off season and, I take it very seriously and you know I go full speed in in the off season because it's no different than if you were to you know be doing agility drills at you know your whatever right. facility you're working at I mean anytime you're training there's a potential of risk it's just like when you play football and it's just right. you got to be smart about it and you know a lot of the guys that I train with know that I play football and so thankfully I'm a lot bigger than most of them so even if they're smaller their techniques are better so I learn from them but I'm not really concerned about getting overpowered or injured because I'm right. bigger than them they're better than me, you know, in intricate little details and techniques. But overall, I mean, my size helps them because they have to work harder. And then their technique helps me because I don't know some of the things that they know. And so, you know, even though I'm younger and less experienced, we learn from each other. So it works out. Yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, I definitely feel like that, uh, that has to help you on the field, just being like light on your feet, change direction, stuff like that. Um, people I know are big on like boxing and stuff or like hand speed and stuff like that. So I'm assuming you've definitely probably seen like a little bit, like a little bit uh, increase, like what you're doing on the field, doing jujitsu, but that's, that's an awesome hobby, hobby to have. But um, so usually it's only five questions. I'm going to kind of throw in a, a six question here. Cause I was looking at your IG. So per your IG, you're an amateur chef. Um, So you mind telling us what your favorite dish is to make? Uh, I would say probably my first thing, my favorite thing to make is a uh, reverse seared New York strip. 
on the Traeger. So um, for those who don't know, or if you don't know, uh, basically a reverse sear is you um, smoke it or you could bake it in the oven if you don't have a, a smoker. You put your steak in the oven until it hits a certain internal temperature. And then you remove it from the heat and then you crank the heat up either on your grill or like a cast iron pan. And then you sear the steak for like two minutes on each side. So you get like a really hard crust. And then the inside is always perfectly medium rare because you bake it first. And then so it gets to the certain temperature you want. And then by the time you grill it, then it's just like making it like a perfect steak. So right. I would say that is my favorite thing to make. But, you know, as the king of barbecue is brisket, this fr coming Friday, I'm actually going to uh, be making my first brisket. So I'm excited to to test that out and uh, see what I can do with it. Sounds fun. Sounds good. So if you're making a steak, what's your what's your go-to size? Mashed potatoes, green beans? Uh, I like a, a nice salt-crusted baked potato. And then potatoes fire. I've been uh, I've been big on the crispy Brussels sprouts recently, and so I, I I enjoy those. If you if you know how to cook them correctly, they're really really good. And if you don't cook them correctly, they're probably the worst vegetable you could probably. Eat. <laughs> so sure. it's a fine line that you you know if you can get it right, then you do it. And if not, I mean I'm a big asparagus, green beans, broccoli. I love vegetables, especially like grilled and you know with a little right. bit of red chili flakes, some salt, pepper, olive oil. Um, I love to eat food, so I'll eat yeah. it all. Yeah, this is probably this probably it shouldn't be the conversation we're having considering I'm on a diet right now, man. That sounds that Oof. sounds so good. <laughs> but uh, 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 really cool. Learn about you. Learn about your journey. Awesome. Um, you guys know how, what it is. Half uh, interview, half movie review. So Ryan picked the Longest Yard, the 2005 version with Adam Sandler. Um, is there a reason why you picked this movie? Uh, I think it's just one of my favorite movies. It's something that you can just throw on, and yeah. I mean, it's gonna make you laugh. I could quote it all day long. <laughs> I mean, there's so many quotes that you can use in a football practice or in a football locker room or just like in general i mean it's it's just a comical film i think adam sandler is one of the best comedians you know of our time yeah. and uh him and burt reynolds and nelly and you know that whole cast i mean it's right if you've seen it it's a it's a classic and i i, can, I never get tired of it every time it's on tv i always throw it on and yes, i just enjoy watching it so you talked a little bit about your likes um you want to get a little bit more into depth on uh what you like so much about this film uh i just enjoy how they can like interact like combine you know like the harshness of prison with still having it be comedic i mean there's still serious parts in the movie but right. i think overall just you know showing convicts in a funny light and just being able to you know make jokes about it and some of the maybe prison um etiquette or like rumors that people hear about they kind of like mess around with and toy with as as a joking matter and uh I mean, from start to finish, it's just there's joke after joke after joke. And when you got Adam Sandler and Chris Rock as two of your main main uh, actors, yeah. I don't think I don't think that's a recipe for a bad movie. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I totally I totally feel that the cast. I love the cast. This movie um, is like the perfect blend of like seriousness and funny. Like they all bring something like unique to the table. Like you have Adam Sandler, Chris Rock, you got Goldberg, the great Kali. You have Nelly, uh, William Fitchner. I mean. I thought the cast worked really well together. Um, it's nonstop laughs throughout the movie. And uh, I like Burt Reynolds being uh, back in the film, being the coach. I thought it was a nice callback to the original. And um, like you said, just nonstop laughs. Uh, very basic movie, but I really like the redemption story of Paul Crew. Um, I really, I'm a big fan of Adam Sandler movies in general and how he always like puts his friends in his films. But um, I'm more so like a fan of him in like his serious films, like um, Uncut Gems. I'm a real big fan of Uncut Gems. But um. I thought this was like a good balance of seriousness and like, like comedy. So I really like this film. Um, do you have any dislikes about the longest yard? Uh, yeah. When caretaker dies, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was, I was hurt when he passed away, man. That was tough. Um, I really don't want dislike anything about the movie. I mean, yeah. besides that, I just, the guy who, who killed him, I thought was not a very good person um, yeah. reason for a reason. So, um, I mean, no, I think that's why I picked it. I think, that was one of my i was either gonna go with that or pearl harbor pearl harbor is one of my other favorite movies um right. but just i like comedy and a little bit of action and um just the guys who are in it i mean it's just it's just a classic for a reason yeah this definitely has a little bit of everything like you just said but um i really like this movie uh just the plot's a little bit basic but it is something like that you've never seen before it's really cool twist on like um just a football story because most of the time you get like the friday night lights you get the underdog story right. um but this is like a cool change of pace um, with like the convicts versus the prisoner, uh, the convicts versus the guards. And then it was really sad when the caretaker died, but then that kind of put like a big twist on it where like the game was actually meaningful now because it really wasn't that serious. And then, you know, caretaker died. So it was kind of, you know, doing it for caretaker. 
But um, like I said, I really like this movie. Just a little bit basic for me plot wise, but uh, overall it's a good movie. So on the channel here, uh, it's a stream movie, so it's gonna be zero out of ten streams on the stream scale. Um, so what what are you giving it? I feel like if I'm gonna be unbiased on it, as I know some people might not like it, I give it like an eight and a half. Eight and a half. All right, eight and a half streams. You heard it here from Ryan. Um, this I know this is one of your favorite movies. Um, just because like I watch movies all the time. Like I said, it's not really like a ground uh, breaking plot or anything like that. Um, uh, kind of straight line movie, but I'm I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna go uh, six flat. I'm gonna give it six streams out of ten. I feel like I feel um, like most people would give it between a six and a seven. So yeah, yeah. That's well, a fair score. I'd probably give it higher if it was like because you had to pay to stream it on like Amazon stuff right now because it wasn't on the TV because it used to be on Netflix. If it was on Netflix, it'd probably be like a six five. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that kind of takes like a hit to movies on the stream scale because if you had to pay for it, it's kind of like that's kind of yeah. kind of have to overcome like that much more just to get over like the price barrier. Right. But um, you heard it. You heard it here. You got you said eight five right. Yeah, eight five from Ryan Hunter. I'm giving it. I'm giving it six. And uh, that's episode thirteen of In the Film Room. I just want to give a quick shout out to Ryan for uh, making some time out of it, taking some time out of his day to come on the channel. Um, you know, great cup champion, a uh, great cup champion and Super Bowl champion. Can't be that many people out there with uh, those two accolades. But um, it's kind of crazy because I was talking about my dad uh, about the video and uh, how you were coming on the channel. He's like, that's crazy because where my dad's from, um, I forget, I forget the guy's name exactly, but he won five great cups as a player and then he won like another five as a as a coach so Jeez. yeah so uh, from just you know little small town pennsylvania uh where my dad from like town uh over so that's just crazy. i mean it's really just crazy but um like i said really appreciate your time and uh maybe we'll run it back in the future after um next season or something like that or whenever you want to come on yeah i'll be able to come back on man thanks for having me it's all good uh good luck jujitsu i'm um, looking forward to seeing what you make next on ig Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. Sounds good. All right. Catch you later, Ryan. Peace. Later.